I'd like to tie to my short exhortation, cultivating a generous heart. Cultivating a generous heart. So far in this series, you said that God wants you to prosper. He wants all of us to prosper. Apostle John, speaking in third John chapter 3, verse 2, he said, God, you wish above all things that you prosper, even as your soul prospers. So God wants you to prosper. Over and over, we have also said that money is a means of exchange of value. That you shouldn't just wish for money, but there must be something you are bringing to the table. You must have a skill. You must have a service. And our senior pastor said to us that you will never come to a point where there is nothing around you that God can use to move you to your next level of financial breakthrough. For someone, it's your skill. For someone, it's a relationship. So for God to move us to the next level in our financial journey, uh, there's always something God will use. And God, and also, he said that when we need money, we should go to God in prayers. When we go to God, God will uncover your value. When you go to God, he will uncover your value. And he will show you the value of the things that you have. God will uncover your value. And he will show you the value of what you have. Also, when we pray, God will not print money, but God will give us ideas. And that this idea is what we will exchange for money. And then on Sunday again, as senior pastor, one of the things he said, he said that adjusting your value system can create a significant shift in your financial status. Adjusting your value system. So please, I want us to read together from the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, I read verse 6 to 11 from the New Living Translation. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 to 11. Paul speaking there. He said, Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. But you, but you must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Verse 8, And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Verse 9. As the scripture says, as, as the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. Verse 10. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. I like that. Say, he will provide and increase your resources, and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way, so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. Praise the Lord. You know, Paul wrote this second letter to the church at Corinth. And if there's anything we know about that church, uh, that church was a wealthy church. The church was gifted. They had the operation of the gift of the Spirit. And there were so many educated people in that church. But if you remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul dedicated that chapter to talk about love to tell them about love, meaning that the church was rich, they had the gift of the Spirit, they had many people that were educated, but they were in short supply of sacrificial love. They were not walking the fullness of the love of God 
That's why Paul wrote that letter to them. And much later, he wrote this second letter to them, second epistle, I mean, this letter, second Corinthians to them. You know, Paul was talking about money, he was talking about them being generous, but he started his uh, conversation with them by talking about a farmer. He said, remember this, a farmer. Of course, he used that because many people can identify with farming. Some years back, a young girl was asked that, where do pineapple come from? He said they come from the tree. Why? She doesn't have an idea. She's been eating pineapple, but she doesn't know that pineapple doesn't come from a tree. It's there on the ground. So Paul told them that because they were familiar with agriculture. So the first thing I like to say about farming is, is this. Any farmer, any serious-minded farmer is always uh, interested, pays attention to the quality of his seeds. True or false? As a farmer is preparing for the next planting season, is careful in selecting his seeds. Another thing a farmer will do is, is concerned about the quality of the soil. Is concerned about the quality of the soil, the condition of the soil. It will till the soil, it will remove different stone, medium sized stone, large stones, storms, roots, uh, unwanted uh, plants. He will also try his best to take care of rodents because these are the things that can have affect his harvest. He's concerned about that. The farmer will watch out for all of these things and he takes time to remove them from the soil. Jesus, speaking to the, his disciples, he told them the story about uh, sowing. He said, one day the sower went out to sow and he sowed the seeds. And later, they asked him, Master, explain the meaning of this parable. And he told them, the soil is actually the art. So, Paul talking about soil here, we can liken it to our hearts as well, as believers. We've been talking about uh, financially being, being financially blessed, uh, flourishing financially. We've been praying, and God has given ideas on how to generate this money. So the question is, when we get this money, how are you going to spend this money? Praise the Lord. And that's what the Holy Spirit is laying on my heart to address. Because surely the money is coming. Amen. Amen. I say surely the money is coming. It doesn't have a choice. It must come. The gold belongs to God. The silver belongs to our God. Amen. There was a time they were looking for money to pay tax. Jesus just gave an instruction. Peter, go and fish. And he came back with a gold coin. Someone, as you go out there tomorrow, you come back with your own check. Amen. I want you to have that assurance that your wealth is around. The wealth is around. But when this wealth enters your hand, it may also enter your heart. Amen? It may enter the heart. And that is why I believe the Holy Spirit is laying it on my heart for us to talk about how to be generous, how to cultivate a generous heart. You know, in Lagos, sometimes, or any part of the world, to make money is not easy. You hustle, right? You hustle. Uh, you fight. You enter traffic, three hours in the traffic. And then sometimes you make some deals, you lose some money. True or false? So when you get that money, there is a tendency in which that when you consider what you went through, you will feel like, mm -mm, I just want to keep this thing for myself. Have you been there before? I have been there. <laughs> I've been there. So God wants us to prosper. But here, as a believer, you need to check your soil. And the soil is your heart. What are those obstacles? What are those things that are in your heart that when money or wealth comes and meets those things there, they may hinder God's beautiful intention. All of us, we are still in the flesh. All of us, we are still growing towards the image of Christ. All of us, we still have weaknesses. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to be talking about this. As human beings, we are designed to always worship something. Human beings. 
We are designed to always worship something. Something we always take priority in our hearts. Something we always take priority. There's no man that doesn't have something that is dominant in his or her heart. Something we always take priority in our minds. And it could either be God, it could either be self, or it could either be the world. Something will always get your attention. And that thing could either be yourself. If it is self that is there on the throne of your heart, then you'll be self-centered. When you get the money, you will want to spend the money only on yourself. When self is, is enthroned, then you will be stingy. When self is enthroned, there will be covetousness, there will be greed. Because you always want more and more. If it's the world that is in your heart, that is the priority in your heart, you will always want to get more. Materialism will be the order of the day. You will not know why. You always want to get the next good thing, the next fine thing, the next this, the next that. Oh, sure, God has given you the means to, to get them. You, you have the money. But if God is not the Lord of the heart, you find that that is either self will be the one that is enthroned or the world. And I'm using the world, I mean the word that world is enthroned because behind the world system, the devil is there. Behind the world system. Jesus one day was tempted. And he was tempted by the devil. And the devil showed him the world, everything, everything, the beauty, the glory. And he told him, you know what? I will give you all of this. If you do what? If you will bow down. Bow down. So behind the world system is the devil. But the devil will not come to any believer and say that I'm the devil. Worship him. Mm -mm. He will come to presenting those things that money can get. Those things that our hearts are longing for. Whoever is enthroned in your heart will determine your attitude towards money. Whoever is enthroned in your heart will determine your attitude towards money, how you get the money, how you manage the money, and how you spend it. Whoever. If it is self that is enthroned, then you will be number one priority. I, me, myself. You make the money, you hit the money, you chop your money. Human nature is selfish. It is natural. It's been said that the strongest instinct in man is that of survivor. And at the heart of survivor is self-preservation. So when you have money, you want to look at what can I use this money to, to tie down? What can I use this money to get so that I can be preserved? Remember in Nigeria, things are not smiling for a lot of people. Things are not rosy for many people. But here you are, God is blessing you. If self is enthroned in your heart, you will not see any other person. You, will, you won't. Two Sundays ago, our senior pastor requested that we should give that some people, their heart is still locked. Their heart is still locked. I pray God will open their hearts in the name of Jesus. Because you will consider yourself, I also have needs. I also have needs. Children are stingy naturally. You have a pack of biscuits, let's say 10 packs of small biscuits. You give a child one. The child doesn't know you have the whole pack. And if you ask the child, can you give me one of that? Many times the child will say, hmm. Some of us are like that. Not knowing you still have the whole lot. God still has a whole lot for you. Amen? And God requesting, demanding for you to let go what is in your hand is just a test. Because true riches are coming for you. The 
There is a broad distinction between living for self and living for God. There is a broad distinction between living for self and living for God. You cannot be a true follower of Christ and you put yourself first. You can't. You cannot be a true follower of Christ and you always put yourself first. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. Jesus said it, a man's life doesn't consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Your life is not all about all you get. If self is enthroned, it will show in how you spend your money. How you spend your money. In Luke chapter 12, there was this story that a, a young man came to Christ. And the man asked Christ, tell my brother to divide our inheritance, the family inheritance with me. Good master. And Jesus said, why calling me good master? And then Jesus gave them a parable. You see that parable in Luke chapter 12, verse 16 to 21, talking about this businessman. Let's read together, please. Luke chapter 12, verse 16 to 21. Luke 12, 16 to 21. Then he spoke a parable to them. A rich man, the grand of a certain rich man, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm reading from the New King James, thank you, the New King James. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no room to store my crop? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then, whose will those things be which you have provided? So, so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards who? Towards God. So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. If self is enthroned, then the heart is susceptible, is prone to greed and covetousness. When self is enthroned, you are prone to greed and covetousness. Are you saying that uh, there are people in church that are greedy? Yes. Are you saying there are people in church that are covetous? Yes. And then I answer fire. They sold something. Why did they keep it back? Why? Greed, so to speak. Greed is that desire for you to have more money. More money. You know, sometimes when I'm tuned to YouTube, listen to some music, and then I tune to radio, and then the kind of songs they play when I'm driving, I find out when they sing about money, I just ask myself, the person that wrote these lyrics, what is going on in his or heart? When money is enthroned, money is glorified. Greed, covetousness. Greed is that desire for more money and more possession. I know there are no greedy people here in this service. There is no greedy person here. Amen? Amen. Covetousness. Covetousness is the lust, is the desire for what you don't have and what you shouldn't have. You don't have it, and you should not even have it in the first instance. Covetousness. It's part of the Ten Commandments God gave his people. Don't covet what belongs to your neighbor. What you shouldn't have. Covetousness hinders the generosity which God requires of his people. Covetousness hinders the generosity. God is liberal. He has given us everything freely to enjoy. And you have his nature inside you. You have his image in you. 
If you are like your father in heaven, you must be liberal. You must be generous as a believer. If covetousness is not dealt with in the heart, it has the tendency of destroying a family's prosperity and posterity. If covetousness is not dealt with, it has the, the, the capacity to destroy a family's prosperity and posterity. You see that in the whole testament. In the story of Achan, when the Israelites they took over Jericho, God had given them that instruction. Everything wiped them away, wiped everything off. But Achan got into a tent. He saw gold, he saw silver, some nice clothes, designer's clothes, amen, Babylonian garments, and he packed some of them, took them home. And he hid them where? He hid them in his tent. I asked myself, when he was hiding them, where was his wife? Hello? <laughs> Where were his children when he was digging in the tent? Most likely, they saw him. Most likely, they saw him. But when the judgment came, it wasn't only about him, amen? He touched his wife and he touched his children. The whole family, the whole generation wiped away, all just because of covetousness. Achan shouldn't have that gold. God has given an instruction. Don't touch it. If the devil, if the world is enthroned in the heart, then the heart is prone to materialism. Materialism. You just want to show off. You want to show off. If you are in Christ, you must be moderate. Amen? You must be moderate. You have the wealth, don't rub it in on people. Praise the Lord. Don't rub it in. Somebody might be like, our pastor Bull is not talking about me. I'm preparing you for when your money will come. When your money will come. As a follower of Christ, you need to strike a balance between living a good life and living just to get the next good thing. i say that again. As a follower of Christ, you need to strike a balance between living a good life and living just to get the next good thing. Pursuing the next good thing doesn't have an end, though. Because another good thing will always come out. Amen? Something good will always come out. So you can't in the name of, oh yes, God has given me everything to enjoy, I need to get this, then you are living just to get. God wants us to live a good life. He wants us to prosper. But your pursuit as a child of God is not about getting. It's not about getting. If the achievement is costing, I mean, if the achievement, whatever you want to get, is going to cost you your relationship with God, is going to cost you your, your, your family, is going to cost you your health, then most likely that thing is not a godly achievement. If it's going to cost you your relationship with God, it's going to cost you your relationship with your family, it's going to cost you your health, then watch out for it. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22. The blessing of the Lord makes a person rich and has no sorrow. So if in the bid of getting that thing, there is sorrow in the home, watch it. If in the bid of getting it, there is sorrow in your heart, watch it. Sometimes our selfish motives as, are disguised as the pursuit of greatness. Sometimes our selfish motives are, di are disguised as the pursuit of greatness. Success is you achieving God's plans and purposes for your life at God's timing while using his methods. Success is you achieving God's plan and purposes for your life at his timing while using his methods. If while in the pursuit of that thing, you have to change method then it's not godly. Amen? It's not godly. And there are people 
that are changing method just to get money. Just to get money. Have you asked yourself what is the purpose of wealth? You know them. You can pay your, you can pay your bills. With money, I pay my bills. I take care of my family, right? And then I save something. And then scripture says a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children, right? So I want to make sure I leave something for them and then their children. So after that, what's next? What is God's intention for giving you that wealth? The children of Israel, when they were in Egypt, before they left, God gave them that, that favor with their masters. Go and ask anything. And they went, they asked. They got gold, they got all kinds of things. And then they moved into the wilderness. And there we saw the reason why God demanded, why God gave them that opportunity for the tabernacle. When it was time for them to build the tabernacle, he demanded for what he gave them capacity to get. So God is giving you capacity to get. God is giving you creative ideas to generate millions. A time is coming. God is going to demand for it. Amen. God is going to demand for it. He is going to demand for it. You need to understand this, that your wealth is a tool in God's mission of reconciling the world to himself. Your money is a tool in God's mission of reconciling the world to himself. So your money is not all about you. God wants you to, to be a, a, a good steward of his resources, to manage the money well. You don't waste. But God also wants to use that resources in your hands to further his agenda of reconciling the world to himself. When wealth is properly used in the church, it will give the church a voice. When I mean the church, I'm not talking about this star, amen. I'm talking about you. You are the church, praise the Lord. When your wealth is properly used, it will give you a voice and an influence in your city. And God wants to use you to reconcile the world to himself. Looking at our environment, there are a lot of people that are poor. You don't need to look far. You're inside traffic, some people will come and knock on your window. In your neighborhood, you see them. Every tush area in Lagos, next to it, you see a slum. You don't need to look far. Wherever you live, there are people that are suffering around you. There are people that are suffering. So what are you doing about them? What are you doing about them? A lot of people are suffering, but we have very few people that are successful financially. And God is counting on those of us that are successful financially to help in eradicating poverty, to help in reducing their suffering. Remember, I'm talking about how you cultivate a generous heart. How you are generous to people around you. On Sunday, Pastor Sam said that if we will prosper as a group, some people in the group must sacrifice for others. If you are going to prosper as a group, he said some people in that group must sacrifice for others. So the question is, I mean, you are giving but is your giving sacrificial? Paul said, bear one another's burden. If I have 500,000 and you have a need, let's say about 200,000, and I give you 20,000 from that 500,000, I'm not sharing your burden because I cannot feel it. Amen? Based on proportion. I'm not feeling it. I give it to you, does it? I don't feel it. It's not sacrificial. And that's what many of us we are doing. I have been there until the Holy Spirit brought my attention to it. Say, bear one another's burden. This thing is a burden. Help the person to lift the burden. And when you lift the burden, you will feel it. Amen. 
growing up in Ibadan, sometimes some women, they sell some things, and then they said, they put it on their head, and they tell, they, if they want, when they want to sell, they ask you, can you help us? So I will size it very well. If you help, when you put it down, you know that you really helped. Because it's heavy. Heavy. If it's not heavy, they will not ask to help them. Bear one another's burden. Burden. Some of us must sacrifice for the group. We must feel it. I'll read again from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 to 19. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 to 19. Paul speaking to Timothy here. I read from the New Living Translation. Thank you. Teach those who are rich in this world. Are you rich? Let me see your hand up. So this scripture is about me. Amen. Are you, are you going to personalize this scripture? It says, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so they may experience true life. You are in business, and the Holy Spirit has shown you this business will blow. Before this business blows, keep this scripture in your heart. Amen? Keep this scripture in your heart. Because sometimes when the money comes, it will shake you. It will shake you. It will shake you. There's some money you make, you know that naturally your hand will come up. You know what I mean? It will come up. You will not know. Your friend will tell you, ah, your styles have changed, though. It's unconscious. Unconscious. In the Old Testament, God established a welfare system for taking care of the weak, the poor, and the vulnerable people in society. In fact, God made it a law for them. There was a system to take care of those who are vulnerable. Let's go through scripture as we see some of the plans God had for them in the Old Testament. And as we are going through it, please, I want you to, to, to ask yourself, how does this apply to me? Deuteronomy chapter 24. Deuteronomy chapter 24. I read from verse 19. So 22, Deuteronomy, the New Living Translation. When you are harvesting your crops and forget to bring in a bundle of grain from your field, don't go back to get it. Leave it for the foreigners, the orphans, and widows. Then the Lord your God will bless you in all you do. When you beat the olives from the olive trees, don't go over the bowls twice. Leave the remaining olives for the foreigners, orphans, and widows. When you gather the grapes in your vineyard, don't glean the vines after they are picked. Leave the remaining grapes for the foreigners, the orphans, and widows. Remember that you were slaves in the land of Egypt, and that's why I'm giving you this command. You are rich. You have a big farm. It's time to harvest. God is saying, be deliberate. Don't harvest everything. Don't clean everything. Leave some for them, those who are vulnerable, so they can come. Let's read again from Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 22. Leviticus 23, 22. When you harvest the crops of your land, do not harvest the grain along the edges of your fields. And do not pick up what the harvesters drop. Leave it for the poor and the foreigners living among you. I am the Lord 
your God. As I was reading this, I imagined a woman in Nigeria, in Lagos. You went to a market and you forgot some things. The, the pepper you bought. Would you go back? <laughs> For where? <laughs> you go back. <laughs> but God is saying, be considerate of the poor. Be considerate. Be considerate. You know, for some people, it's not food that's their problem. They need working capital, right? Some people, they need working capital. And what they need is loan. Loan. A lot of us, we don't joke with our money. We don't joke with our money. So God also gave them a law concerning that. Let's read together as we begin to close. Deuteronomy chapter 15. Deuteronomy chapter 15. From verse 1. New Living Translation. At the end of every seventh year, you must cancel what? You don't want to read it. <laughs> okay, let's start again. <laughs> Once we go, at the end of every seventh year, you must cancel the debts of everyone who owes you money. Let's continue. This is how it must be done. Everyone must cancel the loans they have made to their fellow Israelites. They must not demand payment from their neighbors or relatives. For the Lord's time of release has arrived. This release from debt, however, applies only to your fellow Israelites, not to the foreigners living among you. Verse 4. There should be no poor among you, for the Lord your God will greatly bless you in the land he's giving you as a special possession. 5. You will receive this blessing if you are careful to obey all the commands of the Lord your God that I'm giving you today. 6. The Lord your God will bless you as he has promised. You will lend money to many nations, but you will never borrow, need to borrow. You will rule many nations, but they will not rule over you. Seven. But if there are any poor Israelites in your towns, when you arrive in the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards them. Instead, be generous and lend them whatever they need. Verse 9. Do not be mean-spirited and refuse someone a loan because the year for cancelling debt is close at hand. <laughs> is it me? It's God. <laughs> so if you refuse to make the loan and the needy person cries out to the Lord, you will be considered guilty of sin. Verse 10. Give generously to the poor, not grudgingly, for the Lord God will bless you in everything you do. There will always be some in the land who are poor. That is why I'm commanding you to share freely with the poor and with the other Israelites in need. Hallelujah. Amen. It's not my word. <laughs> so, you're a believer. You did business with another believer. He's owing you. The next thing is, ah, I know one police commissioner at Panty. I must get my money. See, let it go. <laughs> it is called the year of release. Here it, yeah, it says, after every seventh year. So he's saying that, okay, someone comes to you in the sixth year, six years, three months. He's not asking for a loan. You know that this man is not going to, because I must cancel every debt next year. He said, don't refuse. Don't refuse. And when you do this, see, we are New Testament believers, but we need to deepen our love. You need to. You need to deepen your love. Are you really sacrificial? Another believer is owing you. The person has been owing you for, for, for four years, five years, and you see the person. Not that things have improved for this person. Let it go. 
Let it go. May the Lord give you that capacity. Amen. He's saying here, say, don't be mean-spirited. Don't be tight-fisted. La war. <laughs> Open your hands to the poor. Some of us, you know, if you like, ah, if a relative is coming again, I borrowed the money over and over, but they know you have, Amen. God planted you in that family for a reason. You are a redeemer there. A savior there. Play your role. Let God use you. Some people are like, Pastor you don't understand. <laughs> I don't need to understand. It's the word of God. It's the word of God. This was the same spirit of, I mean, not being tight-fisted. This was the same spirit that propelled the early church to create a welfare system for their community. Read in Acts chapter 4, people sold their lands and they brought the money to the apostles' feet. And the apostles, they distributed to those who are in need. So the question is, what have you sold and you brought to this time? Just face front. You've not sold anything. I know some people, they sold their chairs when they started was moving to this facility. They sold their chairs. They dropped it in the offering bowl and they wrote a letter transferring it to the church. That's what they had. But you, just wave your hand to Jehovah. I'm not talking about you bringing to church. How about people in your neighborhood? Some years, some, about two years ago, I saw something online of a man somewhere in the Middle East. He put a fridge on the street and he, he would stock that fridge with drinks, juice, water, soft drink. Anybody can go there and pick. You need, go and pick. So I asked myself, if I should do that at uh, Olushosu <laughs> in Oregon. One person will pack everything. <laughs> He'll pack everything. You will, if you put lock on it, they will break the lock before you come the next day. Greed. <laughs> but will you say because of that you will not be generous? Are you going to say because if you do that, some other people will take advantage of you? People sold their lands to give to the poor. As a church, we have a welfare system. Nobody should go to bed hungry in this time. Nobody. Nobody should go to bed hungry. So the question is, your family, what welfare system do you have? Your family. For people. Who are you paying school fees for? If you go to any public secondary school here in Lagos today, you will see people, you see students that need something. Some years back, there was a young girl living with us. She was in the public secondary school. And I went to, something happened, they asked me to come. I went, and I saw some students outside. They knelt down. So I asked the teacher, what's going on? They said that uh, they're supposed to have math class, but they, they don't have mathematical sets. So that's why they asked them to come out, and they knelt down. So I was trying to process it. Why is it that they don't have mathematical sets? They didn't have the money, right? And now you're sending them out of the class. Would they even understand? That much is a mathematical set. I just did that calculation. Someone can just buy, can buy 100 and dash them. That some of them, if you go to some schools, you will see a child that needs uniform. You will. So you don't need to look far. You don't need to look far. I have a friend some years back, he, he took some close to 
couple of hundreds of thousands of naira, he just went to one of the, the major public hospitals here in Ikeja to do what? Just to pay medical bills. Within a few hours, the money finished. Within a few hours. So, as if as a single person, what are you doing to help those who are vulnerable? I love, I have one good friend. He was my roommate on campus. We lived together for a couple of years. And then when he finished, he got a job with the telecoms company. He served with them and they retained him. And they were paying him very well. Then he went out, traveled out, trainings. But he was single, wasn't married. The money was much, really much for him. Guess what he did? One day, one of our age came to their church, and they were talking, and then he volunteered. He adopted two little girls in the orphanage, and then he was responsible for their school fees. He was single. He was, his parents didn't need much from him anyway. So he was like their father, but the orphanage said they won't release those kids to him until he is married. So he was paying their school fees until he got married. And then those children started living with him. And he sent them to the uni. One of them is married today, one of those girls. So when the girl got, I mean, that girl got married and had a child. One day he called, we were talking. He said, I'm a grandfather. So I look at him. Where is that coming from? You know, he said, I'm not your mate. I said, come on. I said, grandfather, who dash you? And I said, one of his daughters. When he said my daughter, I said, your daughter. I said, you forgot him. I said, oh, I said, the girl is married now, has a child. Single. He used his money well. You don't need to look far. Cultivating a generous heart. Look around. There are people that are in needs around us. A lot of people. The other day, I was somewhere in Arepo, in the supermarket. I wanted to buy some snacks. And there was a young guy in front of me. He asked for just a meat pie, a donut, a meat pie, a sausage, and a scotch egg. And then when it was time for him to pay, he gave them his card. And then it was declined. They told the lady, try it again. <laughs> Insufficient fund. Then he said, he, was, he said he was going to drop one of those items. And I look at him. That meat pie, that sausage, they are not even enough for his size. And he was going to drop one. I told him, don't worry, go with everyone. Then he looked back. I said, don't worry, I'll pay. If he sounded as if, are you, are you real? In my head, how much? Just go. Then he was looking at me as he was going. There are many avenues to be generous. You don't need to know anybody from anywhere. You don't need to know them. In conclusion, if God has blessed you financially, take it upon yourself to help as many people in the family of faith. Help as many people in church. Help as many people to be established to be independent. Help as many people as you can. Another way you can be generous is to reduce your personal consumption. Reduce your personal consumption so you can give the extra to other people. When some of us, when you want to eat amala, amala with a video, you know the number of Meat, they call it orishi rishi. Calm down. Your body doesn't need all that protein. Give out. Just look straight. Because I'm not talking about anybody. I said, another way to be generous is for you to reduce your personal consumption so you can provide financial assistance to others. I take from Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. Galatians 6, 10. Galatians 6, 10. Therefore, Galatians 6, 10. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, 
we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Whenever you have the opportunity, do good to everyone, especially to those in your house fellowship, especially to those in your unit. You see them. This guy comes to church with the same trouser and the same shoe. You know him. When you see that shoe, you know it's him. You don't need to look up. You know he's the one coming. Do something. Amen? Do something. Don't wait till they ask you. Paul also speaking. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 8. 1 Timothy 5, 8. But those, but those who won't care for their relatives, especially those in their own household, have denied the faith. Such people are worse than unbelievers. Those who won't care for their relatives. And caring, see, some of us, you have bad relatives. There was a lady years back when she shared her story. I just, I knew God has, God had healed her that time. She said her parents were not, were not around, her parents were dead, and they, there was an auntie that they, they, they did family meeting. Okay, you are going to live with this auntie. So she was staying with that auntie, and guess what? The auntie didn't send her to school. She said she was in primary school. These aunties' children will go to school. Those, there are some in primary school. There are some in secondary school. They will go, but she will not go. The auntie claimed she didn't have money for uniform. Until a neighbor noticed that this girl is always around. The neighbor now accosts the auntie. I always see this child. What's going on? And the auntie just wriggled around it. Eventually, she went to school. She said when she was in school, she suffered. Suffer. Sometimes you go to bed not eating. Meanwhile, there was food in the house. Fast track. This person became a graduate. She got a job at an international company. She was doing well. And then she forgave that auntie. Said she would go and buy all sorts. Said the first time she tried it, the auntie didn't believe. She didn't. Said the auntie had to ask for her forgiveness. That if, they, if anybody told me that you would be the one to come and do this for me, I would never have believed it. So that it's possible your relatives are not that nice to you. But the love of God has been shared abroad in your own heart. Forgive them. Bless those you can bless. The Proverbs chapter 11 verse 24. As we close. Proverbs 11.24. Proverbs 11.24. Give freely and become wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous we do what? We prosper. The generous we prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. God will refresh you. Amen. Say, God will open new doors for you. God will elevate you. God will lift you. God will honor you. God will strengthen the work of your hand. God will prosper your business. You will flourish beyond your imagination. God will use you to repair people's lives. God will help you. He will strengthen you to be a deliverer for people. In the name of Jesus. Can you just bow your head? And I want you to say a prayer. Lord, give me the grace to focus on others. Give me the grace to focus on others and not just on myself. Give me the grace to focus on others and not just myself. Lord, give me the grace to focus on others and not just myself. My life will not just be about the abundance of possession, but in service for your divine pleasure. My life will not just be about me, 
but it will be in service of your divine pleasure. You will use me to bring joy, to bring relief. You will use me. Holy Spirit, empower me. Holy Spirit, empower me. Holy Spirit, empower me. Holy Spirit, empower me. Father, I commit my talent, my time, my money, my wealth. I commit to your mission of reconciling the world to yourself. I commit to the mission of reconciling the world to yourself. I commit everything you've given me to bring people back to your love. Let me be your hand, Jesus. Let me be your hand, Holy Spirit, to comfort others. Use my bank account to pay medical bills. Use my bank account to feed people. Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. To restore walls that are broken down. Use me, Lord. Lord, I will not be selfish. I won't be selfish. I won't be selfish, Lord. I won't be selfish. I won't be selfish. I will not be selfish. Lord, I thank you. You are here this evening. You know your relationship with God is not the best. You just know it. I want to say, Lord, I'm sorry for the way I've lived. I'm sorry for how I've even spent the resources you put in my hand. Lord, I want to make amends today. Can you just put your hand on your chest? Thank you. Just put your hand on your chest. If your hand is on your chest, can you just raise the other hand? You're watching online. You can just do the same. Put your hand on your chest and make this commitment to Christ. Can you say this prayer with me? Say, Father, I come to you today in the name of Jesus. I ask for your forgiveness and I ask that you take me as your child. I confess my sin and I accept Jesus as my Lord. Thank you, Father, for saving me. Amen. Let me pray for you, Father. Thank you for these people you have drawn to yourself. I ask that you give them the grace to walk with you and I ask that you show them the path you have for them. Thank you for filling their hearts with your love. Thank you, Father, for making them part of what you're doing. Thank you, Jehovah. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Daystar, raising room models.